Good morning. Uh, what a blessing it is to have so many uh, faithful servants who uh, just serve not only in children's ministry, but in so many aspects of what makes uh, church and being together possible. And so I want to thank all of you guys who just dig in and say, uh, serve faithfully and doing what God's called you to do. Whether anyone sees you or recognizes you or not, uh, you're certainly appreciated and your work is valued, uh, not only to us, but to the kingdom. So thank you uh, so much for being faithful to the Lord and his church. Um, we're going to go ahead and dismiss, if you haven't already, the youth. Uh, and so if youth, you can head out to Lucas. And parents, if you'd like to go as well to uh, let Lucas share his heart with you, that would be awesome. Um, and this morning, we are going to dive right back in where we left off in the book of 2 Peter. So if you grab your Bibles, I encourage you to bring that to church. If you don't have one, there should be one um, in the uh, pew there in front of you or next to you. But let's turn to the book of 2 Peter. I enjoyed uh, making a showing at the men's golf day yesterday. All you guys had a great time with you. Thanks for coming out. A lot of South Campus, North Campus guys coming together. You know, they say if your pastor is a really good golfer, you should be concerned. Um, and so I just want to reassure you, you guys are still in good hands. Yeah, it was that rough. But I was on a good team. <laughs> Okay, as we dive back in, we uh, read over verses 1 through 11 last week, and we only got through the first four verses. So we're going to continue on verses 5 through 11. And as we receive God's word and we read it, I'd like to ask you if you would be willing to stand uh, together as we just read verses 5 through 11. Peter writes this, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. You can have a seat. Last week, as we looked at uh, Peter's introduction, we saw that Peter really is, was a man who, at the end of his life, was trying to communicate to the church the, the very truths that were most important to him that he had learned after following Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit and watching God do amazing things through his life, now coming to the end. And the, the main thing he wanted us to be aware of and to receive was the fact that our identity as Christians means that we have been given in and through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, all that we need that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us in virtue and glory. And then he tells us not only in Christ do we have all we need for life and for godliness, but we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises that we may be partakers of the divine ma nature. It is wonderful. I love it. And so what we see here is this amazing promises, and, and he starts off by communicating to us all that we have been given on the merits of Jesus. And aren't we grateful today that our salvation, our standing before God, the faith, this precious faith that we have obtained has not come on our own merit, but on the merits of the righteousness of Christ on our behalf. Amen? That is, that is probably the, the most radical, greatest truth that any person could ever accept and receive into their lives. And yet, Peter wants us to know that though we've been given these things freely, and though we have more than we could ever imagine in Christ, 
There is an aspect where we must partner with God and do our part to be diligent to receive and to walk in and to practice and to, you know, experience the fullness of all of those promises that God has laid before us at the table. And that's what this is about in this passage today. And if you would like to circle this verse or just jot it down in your notes, and um, I'm just forewarning you guys, I have a lot of I'm going in a lot of different directions. You might have to re, you know, take notes and go look at them again and, and look at some of these cross-references. But I'd like to point out what I believe is the key verse of chapter 1. And you might not initially think it at first, but look at verse 8. Verse 8 contains within it sort of the key verse of this section we're in today. Verse 8 tells us, For if these things, and we're talking about seven things that he's going to tell us about, we're going to get into them in a, in a moment, but if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says here the goal is to be fruitful, that's a farming term, having fruit coming forth from the vine, and to be, uh, not to be barren, or uh, barren is a, it's a reproductive term. If a woman is barren, she can't produce something out of herself. And so we want to be productive and we want to be fruitful in what? Specifically, the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this chapter is about coming to a greater knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because back in verse 3, we're told that, these, um, uh, that when we receive all we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so this is an important uh, aspect for us to understand. What does it mean to have the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Here's the thing about knowing somebody. Okay, there are three levels on which we get to know another person. Level number one, we get to know somebody by learning just learning facts about that person, right? We can look at a person and say, oh, so-and-so has brown hair and brown eyes and um, they you know, and, and we can start to learn things physically and start to just get to know someone for what we see in them. And then there's a second level to knowing someone, isn't there? It's when now, okay, I know some things about you, but now I want to relationally get involved with you. And that's when I start to spend time with you and I start to talk to you about things and I start to get to know your heart and the things that you enjoy and the things you don't like. And, right, we start to develop a deeper relationship. But did you know there's even a third level of getting to know somebody? And that is when I take that relational knowledge and I start to order my life and my priorities around the things that you like and that, you, and that matter to you so that I can know you in a deeper way, right? I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm not a huge fan of masterpiece theater English dramas. But since I've been married, I've sat in front of hours of Downton Abbey and all sorts of other shows that exist out there. Not because I love them, but because relationally, spending time doing those things, when, when, my, when, when I sacrifice something or, or I come into something that, uh, that my wife is interested in or my wife loves, right, I am, I am relationally entering into a deeper knowledge with her. And same vice versa. As much as my wife has sacrificed for me or... or, or, or taken her life and, and sort of formed it around my heart or, or the things that I'm called to, when we do that mutually for one another, we begin to know each other on a, dif on a deeper level. Why do I go through all that? Because when we're talking about knowing Jesus, Peter is talking about these three things. We, we know Jesus by growing in our knowledge. We read his word. We, we get to know the Lord. We get to know God as we read his word and we, we soak it in and we learn the facts and we grow in uh, sort of a ment our mental capacity about who God is and what he's like. But then we also get to know Christ by entering into intimate relationship with him, don't we? Our prayer closets and our worship time and our, our quiet times with the Lord and being filled with his spirit and learning what it means to walk in the spirit and be led by the spirit and to walk with Jesus and to know the heart of God and to hear his voice, right? But there's a deeper level. 
And that is that the capstone of my knowledge of Christ comes when I begin to order my life and my priorities and the things that matter to me around the life and the priorities and the things that matter to him. That is when, the, that, that is when there's a, a maturity and a fullness to my knowledge of Christ. And that's why Peter tells us in chapter 1 that our knowledge of Christ comes when we diligently add to our faith seven virtues or seven characteristics of our faith. This is why at the end of the book in chapter 3 verse 18, Peter closes by saying, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? Wasn't this Paul's aim in his life? Paul wrote to the Ephesians that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in what? The knowledge of him. This was Paul's aim in life, Philippians 3.8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So here's a big question we're gonna ask today. How is your pursuit going of the knowledge of Christ? How are, how are you doing in pursuing knowing Jesus on all of those three levels? Well, you're gonna be able to take a good assessment based on our passage this morning. And again, verse five, here's how. Peter says this. But also for this very reason. What reason? Because we've already received everything we need for life and godliness. Because we have exceedingly great and precious promises. Because of these things, he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, the brotherly kindness love. This is the deepest way we get to know Jesus, by doing these things. And notice how we do them. He uses this interesting phrase. He says, giving all diligence. The word diligence means to bring every effort, to literally exhaust yourself, exhaust your resources in accomplishing. Bring every effort into seeing that your spiritual life is continually growing. And you know what this tells me about spiritual growth is that spiritual growth is not an automatic process. It doesn't mean, hey, it's, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, your faith is there, you've trusted in Jesus Christ, that's a firm foundation. But giving all diligence tells us that if you want to mature and grow and see your faith completed and see your faith supported, it's going to take some partnership on your behalf, some diligence, some effort on your, on your part to come into that place. I'll say, but, but Josh, what about the fruit of the Spirit? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Aren't these things supposed to just kind of naturally come? Well, yes and no. I know many Christians who believe in Jesus that aren't walking in the Spirit, and as a result, don't demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And here's another thing about growth, spiritual growth you need to understand. Two things. Number one, spiritual growth is not related necessarily to the amount of time you've known Jesus. In other words, there can be a 70-year-old Christian who is a child in Christ, and there can be a three-year-old Christian who is mature in Christ, depending on how much they have decided to give all diligence in adding to their faith. And the second principle about faith, growing faith, is that you can grow as much or as little as you're willing to grow in Christ based on your consumption of what he's supplied. You see, fruit is only as good and effective as one's willingness to consume it. I can lay out a feast before my children, but they must eat it in order to grow. I can supply instruction for people, but it's only when they begin to receive it and apply it themselves that knowledge begins to abound. Yes, we have been given everything in Christ, but if we don't walk in everything Christ has given us, then we will lack in our spiritual growth. In one sense, we completely rest in the salvation that Christ has offered us, but in the other hand, we work 
because we want to experience all the benefits of that salvation here and now. Paul puts it like this to the Hebrews. He says this, we desire that each one of you shows the same diligence, that's the same word, the same effort to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but you imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In other words, he's saying true faith is not a sluggish faith, but a faith that is constantly moving towards who we are to be in Christ. And notice again, I don't want to be misunderstood, he's not talking about working in order to obtain the faith. Uh, We can put it like this. The faith that we have freely obtained through the righteousness of Christ must be readily maintained in order for it to grow effectively. That's why he says, what do we need to do with all diligence, with everything that's in us, with our full effort? Add to your faith. No, 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 mark it. He doesn't say add to the faith. He doesn't say add a bunch of requirements in order, you know, salvation is through faith plus A, B, C, and D. He doesn't say add to salvation. No, he says add to your personal faith. The word add in the Greek means to undergird with support or to furnish or to make beautiful. Your foundation is there. That's the faith. Your trust in Christ. And that's the most important thing that exists. But let me ask you, is your faith becoming beautiful? Is it becoming supported? Is it becoming mature? Or is your faith like this beautiful room with no furniture? Right? You have this, this floor plan. This, the builder has, has built the thing and, and written the checks. And you have this beautiful home or this beautiful room. Now what are you going to furnish it with? Paul's going to say we need seven things, seven pieces of furniture, so to speak, or seven pillars to support this beautiful deck of faith. Regarding the Greek word for uh, add to your faith, commentator Matthew Poole writes this. He says, it may be a metaphor taken from the ancient way of dancing in which they joined hands with one another, thereby helping and holding up one another. So next time you start to think of uh, a maturing faith, just think of seven Jewish guys dancing. Like that's the kind of faith I need. Interlocked, all mutually uh, 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 submitted and working with one another. Or I could sum it up like this. God wants your faith, right? You started by trusting in Christ. But now, God wants that faith to be furnished and adorned with moral and spiritual beauty. He wants that faith to be manifested by maturity and obedience. And he wants that faith to be supported and undergirded by these seven pillars of character. Next, he lists what these seven things are. And if you want to make an interesting side note, Proverbs 9.1 says, Wisdom has built her house and she has hewn out her seven pillars. I find it interesting that the the author of the Proverbs tells us that wisdom has seven pillars or seven supports, and it just so happens that Peter lays out seven characteristics of our faith, and I think they coincide. And so let's go through them. Number one, he says, add to your faith or your trust in Christ, add to that virtue. The word virtue means moral excellence. Now, we could just maybe define it like this. Loving that, loving and practicing that which is morally upright. Loving and practicing that which is morally upright. Now, it should be said that there are many virtuous people who kind of pride themselves in their morals that don't know Christ. That's not what he's talking about. He's not saying be moral for the sake of morality. No, he's saying that, remember last week, We have been partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature is the nature of Christ. The nature of Christ is virtuous or moral, has a moral purity, a moral excellence to it. And so we, not just outwardly, but inwardly, are to be clothed with moral excellence, pursuing that which is blessing and pleasing the heart of Christ. And so this is a very challenging question for us. Can we truly say that we're increasing in virtue, in moral excellence, if when we leave the four walls of the church, our life is marked by loving things that God hates or despising things that God loves? 
I think we need, to, we need to look honestly, not just confining our virtue to what we do inside of a church building and singing a song and lifting our hands, but how that virtue, how what we love and what we hate in the deepest part of our hearts carries over into our everyday life. On top of this, our witness to non-believers becomes negatively affected when our standards of morality don't even hold a noticeable difference to theirs, to a culture that's influenced by the enemy. Now, I'm not saying we should walk around legalistic or, or uh, get on our moral high horses. That's not the point. The point is, Jesus is morally excellent, so we ought to pursue moral excellence in our lives. We ought to see more purity coming in what we do and what we say and what we practice and what we watch because we are being made into the image of Christ. And then he says, number two, the second pillar, add to your virtue knowledge. And we'll define knowledge simply as this, expanding your spiritual understanding of God and his will. And it is important to understand the context here is a spiritual knowledge. Now, Peter isn't saying anything against worldly knowledge. We ought to learn. We ought to be learners. We ought to be constant learners. We ought to excel in the things God's called us to. We ought to continue expanding our knowledge base and expanding our learning so that we can more effectively serve Christ in this world. But the word epinosis here means the highest form of knowledge. And of course, we know the highest form of knowledge is the knowledge of God and his will. So here's the challenge here. Are you adding, are you giving all diligence, every effort to understanding the knowledge of God and and his will for your life in a deeper way? Remember what Paul said to the Colossians in chapter one? For this reason, we also Since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with, say it with me, the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in what? The knowledge of God. This is what he's talking about. We ought to be expanding our knowledge of God and his will. And here's what it looks like. When you encounter a trial, a temptation, a decision, a circumstance in your life, it is God's desire that you would be increasingly able to know how you ought to deal with that situation, that trial, that temptation, that circumstance, that decision, according to God's will. I got this big decision, big big business decision I've got to make. You know, I got offered this job. What do I do? Well, you know, there is knowledge, there is spiritual knowledge that will give you insight into what you should do. And if you're growing in that knowledge, you know what's going to happen? God's word's going to start to repeat in your mind because you've been putting it into you. And you're going to start to think things like, okay, what would matter to God? You know, I can't compromise my character. I can't compromise my integrity i got to protect my priorities and my values. And all these things have come because you've increased in your knowledge of God. So now when you go to make that decision, it's informed by truth and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I want to get involved in this relationship, and I don't know if it's the Lord's will. Well, you get to know it's the Lord's will by growing in your knowledge of God and his will. By feeding yourself the word of God on a regular and consistent basis, by time in prayer, by discerning the heart of God. Oh, my husband, my wife, they just drive me nuts. I don't know what to do. Increasing your knowledge of God is what you do. Because in doing that, you begin to understand how to respond. You begin to understand what you should say and what you shouldn't say and how you should say it and how you shouldn't say it and how you should sacrifice and where you should expect. And, and all of a sudden, well, you know, what hap- you know what's happening is you're gaining the mind of Christ. Isn't, that, isn't this what Paul told us we ought to do? Put on the mind of Christ. Increase in your knowledge. And of course, adding knowledge to virtue matters because being morally upright just to be morally upright is, is not the point. It's when I start to know the heart of God and then I start to live that out in my virtue, that is when it becomes um, uh, an addition to, to my faith. And so I want to encourage you guys, continue 
to pursue a knowledge by pursuing God and his word in your life. And to me, this is a, a conviction because ultimately, if, if the knowledge of God is profitable for all things, it should really be paramount. It should be my paramount pursuit in regards to knowledge. And I'm, I'm challenged by this as a father. Right, how much attention and demand do I give to my children? You know, learn your math, learn your science, learn your English, do schoolwork, do your homework, hours of, and, and on an equal level or not e- even more so, am I teaching them spiritually about the knowledge of God? The heart of God, when you face this trial, when you come across this situation in your life, when you grow and you experience this, this is how God would want you to respond, and this is what God's word says. I'm challenged by that. Not just on that level, but for myself, and I think we all should be, because we want to pursue the knowledge of God to a greater degree in our lives. All right, let's continue on. He says, now add to your knowledge self-control. See, now that we know what God's desire is, it's important that we implement that into our life. We'll define self-control like this. Governing yourself according to God's truth and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Governing yourself according to God's truth and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. One commentator calls self-control the grace that represses all inordinate appetites. I I like, it's kind of wordy, but... The grace from God that suppresses all inordinate, ungodly, undesirable appetites of our flesh. That we take mastery over our flesh through the power of his Holy Spirit. Has anyone else in here noticed that there are things in your flesh that desire and long for things that God doesn't want for you? Anyone else except for me have this struggle within themselves? I know Paul did. Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. It's a sin in me, and the things I, I want to do, I don't, I, you know, don't want to do, those are the things I do, and oh, who's going to save me from this body of sin and death? Thank God in Christ Jesus. The lust of the eyes, John says, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, how do we resist these things? Again, this is where knowledge directly is connected to self-control. When I know the desires of God, I can identify the things in my life that aren't the desires of God and start to do battle against those things. Taking my thoughts captive, the Bible says, under the obedience of Christ. Not allowing sin to reign in my mortal body, Paul tells us. (laughs) And there might be some who say, oh, well, you know, I've I've got mastery over myself pretty good. I don't struggle with, like, the big sins. Hey, guys, self-control is not just about big sins. Self-control infiltrates every small aspect of our life. Self-control is tested in what we watch and how much we watch of it, in what we play and how many hours we play of it, in what we eat and how much we eat of it, in what we say and the words and the tones we allow ourselves to say it with, in what we feel and how we allow those feelings to govern our life, in what we think and how much we allow ourselves to think about it. You see, self-control... It's about understanding the heart and will of God and letting that govern my own desires in every area of my life. And in the Bible, I love that the word self becomes, comes before control. Because we like to control. We like to control others. We like to control our circumstances. We like to control our plans. We like to control a lot of things. But the only way we can control ourselves <laughs> is by the Spirit of God. And that is the thing we ought to be focusing on the most, to have self-control. Number four, the fourth pillar, he says, is add to self-control perseverance. Because when you are trying to do battle against your flesh and you're like controlling yourself, sometimes it just gets discouraged and you just want to give up. We'll define perseverance as continuance through difficulties and obstacles. The book of Revelation, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches, and he makes all of these amazing promises to them. And at the end of each letter, he specifies that those who will receive the promises are those that overcome. It is this idea that regardless of what comes at me, 
I'm going to persevere through it. The word in the Greek literally means to bear up on your shoulders, to carry a weight. You know, there is a weight, the greatest weight of our sin Jesus carried for us, amen? But in this life, we face difficulties that try to take us out of the race. And perseverance comes when you are able to look beyond where you're currently at to what, is, what you're headed towards. It is only when your eyes are, Paul tells us in Romans 5, on the things which you can't see, that perseverance will begin to produce character and hope in your life. And what should we keep our eyes on in order to persevere through life? Well, the divine nature of Jesus. He taught us perseverance, didn't he? That despite a cross in his path, despite the weight of the sin of the world to be carried upon his shoulders, what does the Bible say in Hebrews 12? Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. How? Fixing your eyes upon Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus showed us the way to persevere. Not by keeping his eyes on the cross, but keeping his eyes on what lie ahead of the cross. And so we ought to keep our eyes lying ahead of our circumstances to the promises of eternity and persevere through life. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean that we're going to be free of sorrow, but it means that we trust that those things have a, a greater outcome for those who are trusting in Christ. Well, number five, the fifth pillar, we're almost through here. He says, add to your perseverance godliness. Now, godliness is an interesting term because when we hear, hear that word in English, we often think like godliness is becoming more like God. And that's not necessarily what the word means in the Greek. Godliness here implies a reverence, a respect of God in what we do and what we say. Godliness reflects that I am considering God in the things that I do. Let me think about that for a moment. Can you just think about that for a moment? When I put on godliness, what I'm saying is that I am reverencing God in how I worship. I am reverencing God and how I serve. I am reverencing God. I'm giving attention to his nature and his character in what I say and how I choose to spend my time. You guys, we don't want to be, fall into the category of people that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 3 where he says they have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof. In other words, when you look at them, it looks like they reverence God. But when you take a close examination of their life, there is no demonstration of his power at work in their life. True godliness is, a, is, is, is one, is, is a mentality that we have where we truly reverence and consider the nature and character of God in everything we do. So the question here, how often in my day-to-day -day life is God considered, revered, worshipped. I think this is important for us to take a, 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 an assessment of. 1 Timothy 4, 8, Paul says, for bodily exercise profits a little. It's not completely useless. It's, it's a little bit profitable. But godliness, same word, is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. It's the most profitable thing we can do to reverence and consider God in everything. Godliness. 
I find myself easily forgetting God when I'm doing the most spiritual of things. I mean, how many times do I sit in the church while the living God is being worshipped? Like, take yourself back 2,500 years. Go to the temple when the living God is worshipped. Experiencing, experience the trembling knees of people who were afraid of, of the presence of God because of how powerful he was. Consider the priests that, that would fall down on their faces because of the power, the, the presence of the glory of God. And, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians that the glory that we now experience in, in the face of Christ is even much more glorious than the glory of God that was demonstrated through the law. And here I am. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, what am I going to have for lunch today? Oh, shoot, I got that thing tonight. Oh, look at that guy up in the front standing up and lifting his hands. Gosh, when's the music going to be done? I, I realize I'm like nitpicking one little area here. But, but it goes to show that in our flesh, it is very easy for us to not consider God. I mean, he, he, he called everything out of nothing. We talked about this divine power last week. Grab a city if you weren't here. But we ought to consider God, and that is adding to our faith godliness. And then number six, he says, add to this brotherly kindness. We can call this cherishing other Christians as your own family. The word here, Philadelphia, brotherly love, a deep loyalty, a friendship, companionship. We're all on the same team. We're all of the same family. Not divided, but united with the same heart and the same mind as Paul said we ought to be. And I've mentioned it before, but I'm going to mention it again because I think it's a tragedy in the church. How many churches are filled with people that only go to that church because they hate people at the other church? Thank God for brotherly kindness. Uh, notice real quick, the first five pillars these are all things that basically we do within ourselves. They're sort of inward character developments. But the last two things, brotherly kindness and love, are things that we do to other people. And I can maybe sum up that principle like this. The healthier, the healthier we become spiritually, the more helpful we become to others. In other words, the, the healthier you become as an individual with the Lord and your virtue and your knowledge and your self-control and your godliness these things, the more helpful you're going to be able to be to other Christians. Not only other Christians, but other people, the world itself. For he capstones off the complete maturing of our faith with this final and seventh pillar, and that is love. Or we could say the sacrificial love of Christ, agape, giving oneself for others as Christ gave himself for us. Now, this is truly the capstone of a maturing faith. Christ-like God for, uh, Christ-like love for God, Christ-like love for other people. It's the end of our faith. So these seven things, you guys, locked, arm in arm, pillars beneath this deck, furniture in this room of faith, they beautify, they support, they mature our faith in Christ. And we ought to be diligently adding our faith, uh, making it a priority on these things. So verse 9, we're almost done, but notice now he talks to us about those who lack these things in their life. Verse 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. This is a scary verse. It basically says, when you or I get stunted in our growth, and we neglect our part in diligently maturing and growing our faith, 
what happens is blindness sets in. We defined short-sighted, uh, spiritual short-sightedness last week. It's when you forget where you came from, that's the cross. You forget where you're going, that's heaven. And you become overly consumed with just where you're at. You can't see what's in front of you, or you can only see what's in front of you. You can't see what's behind you or ahead of you. Let us not forget, as he says here, how much sin has been wiped clean from our slate because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Don't forget that. Don't forget what a high price was paid for your failure and your sin before God. Let us not forget how much sin God has taken from us and how much blessing he has imparted to us. I heard a great definition for the word nostalgia. It's remembering the pleasures of sitting in front of the fire without remembering you had to cut the wood. It's true, right? Spiritually, we can get so used to the blessings that are ours in Christ that we forget what life was like without them. Remember the Israelites allowed their difficulty through the wilderness to remove the memory of how oppressive their slavery was in Egypt? Let us not be those who forget, because we are people who are prone to forgetfulness. Let us not be short-sighted. And he closes it in verses 10 and 11 by giving us one final application. He says, therefore, and therefore, because we don't want to be short-sighted, we don't want spiritual blindness to set in. Brethren, be even more diligent to make your call. That's what we received when we heard the gospel. And election, that's what God did um, before the foundation of the world in choosing us to be saved. Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and so, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, this is the end of our race. This is the finish line. The eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But notice he, he gives some warnings. He says, be diligent. It's that same word. Give every effort to make your call and election sure. Are you sure? How can you be sure that the faith that you profess to have is truly a saving faith? How you are sure is that there is a progression in your life of growth. I realize this is, is going to be a hard pill to swallow, okay? I didn't write this stuff. I like how Warren Wearsby put it. He said, it's not our profession of faith that guarantees we are saved. It is the progression in faith that gives us that assurance. Someone who just says, I believe. Well, the demons believe and they tremble. Yes, it is your trust in your faith alone that guarantees you salvation. But how do you want to cross that finish line? It is not a bad thing. And I realize it sounds like a bad thing because of how our culture lies to us and because of how selfish we are and because of how entitled we are. But it is not a bad thing to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I want to make my calling and election sure. I want to examine my life to ensure that I am walking and growing in my faith and walking in the will of God. That's why Paul says to 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves as to whether or not you are in the faith. You couldn't get more clear than that. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. And I don't say this to scare people or to bring a, a, a word of condemnation. But I'm saying we can't afford to be afraid to look in the mirror and say, does my life and my progression of faith and my desires line up with, that, with a faith that is working? Not working for my faith, but working from my faith. To move into the image of Christ. I think it's important. Peter says it's important. Paul says it's important. It's true that at different seasons, in different seasons, our faith might grow at different paces. It might be moving kind of slow at certain times. I might grow leaps and bounds at other times. But is my faith in a constant forward motion? 
am I constantly seeking and desiring to grow and expand on these seven things in my life? And the ultimate outcome here, he says, if these things abound in your life, you won't stumble. The word stumble is to, to permanently fall off the course. You're running that race, you trip, you break your leg, you're off the course, and you're not going to finish. It says these are the things that guarantee us a finish. And verse 11, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Abundant entrance was a Greek term used for an Olympian. If uh, an Olympian would come back victorious in their event back to town, they would be welcomed with what they called an abundant entrance, right? The whole city would gather around and, and they would bring a crown and they would place it on their head and there would be cheering and, and victory chants for this person coming in victoriously. And this is a language that was used here where Peter's saying, hey, when you cross that finish line of the race, do so in such a way that you receive an abundant entrance. Do you know that the Bible teaches that all Christians who have sincere and true faith in Jesus will be saved? But there will be varying degrees of reward, varying degrees of reception at their entrance into the kingdom. I'm not inventing this stuff. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the day where all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ for the things they did in this life. He said, everything that you built your life with is going to be examined. And that which is worthless is going to be burned away, and that which is, has, is eternal is going to go through and be rewarded and sort of transfer into the economy of that kingdom. And he ends it by saying this in 1 Corinthians 3.15, If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. The, the, the wording there is, as though he's, he's coming through a wall of fire as though he's stumbling across the finish line, barely made it by the skin of his teeth. And Peter's saying, when you cross that finish line, do you want to come across with the hair on your leg singed because there's nothing left? Do you want to come across face-to-face -face with Jesus, only to realize that everything you invested yourself in, pursued, and prioritized in your life was completely worthless to the kingdom? Or do you want to come across that line with a victorious, abundant entrance because you prioritize the things in your life around adding th to your faith the things that really matter? I know that's kind of hard to receive and hear, but this is what Peter is telling us. We want to have great confidence in the day that we see Jesus face to face. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're going to be sinless. But we will strive towards the image of Christ and have confidence in that day for the work that we did and the things that we built and the things that we pursued here in this life. So, how much will you care to pursue knowledge of Jesus by adding these seven things to your faith. For it is the Christian who is committed to their spiritual growth who will mo mo most abundantly experience the promises and the resources of God here in this life and in the next. And so a good word from Peter, a challenging word for Peter from Peter, and he says it because he wants us all to realize that the finish line is around the corner and he wants us all to finish well. So let's pray and ask the Lord to really speak these things into our heart. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word and uh, some hard things to like dissect and understand def definitely. But Lord, true nonetheless. And Lord, we want our lives to count. We want them to be fruitful. We don't want them to be barren. We want to be fruitful in the knowledge of God and our relationship with you. 
And Lord, we pray that you help us in the areas of our weakness to continue that pursuit. Lord, I even pray that now by your Holy Spirit, you would be challenging individuals, each one of us, in areas where our pursuit of, of Christ and his character maybe has waned or in areas where it needs to grow. Lord, that we would be diligent in giving every effort to take this beautiful, amazing, precious faith you've given us and to add to it, to furnish it, to undergird it, to strengthen it so that it can be, and we can be complete and mature and lacking in nothing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to help us as Christians. We pray that you would continue to bless the ministry of of Crossroads Church and all that we're trying to do, that you would refine us, Lord, make us holy and pure body um, to effectively pursue and, and impact, Lord, the kingdom of God here in these counties, in this city. Lord, we pray that you continue to add to the church daily those who would be saved, that they might know forgiveness and love and true life in Christ. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the work that you do in our lives. And we don't want to forget that your word tells us that it is God who works in you both to will and to do your good pleasure. Lord, thank you for putting that desire in us. Thank you for giving us the resources. But now, as he continues, Lord, to say, we want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We'd like to work out all the things you worked into us. Do our part in obedience to your call. Give us help, we ask, by your Holy Spirit. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good stuff. Can't wait to get back into the rest of chapter one with you next week. Let's stand as we close in the song together. Um, I pray that you guys go encouraged, strengthened in the spirit, uh, and ready to tackle that which lies ahead of you. Amen. Let's, let's close with a song of praise.